My name is Shiel, and last week was TIFF, the Toronto International Film Festival, and what a fun week that was. Last year was my first time watching multiple movies at TIFF, and I did it again this year because I had a blast. You may have seen my last year's review, check it out So there. this year, I watched eight movies, including the new and potentially last Studio Ghibli movie directed by Hayao Miyazaki, a good horror movie, and the weirdest movie I've ever seen. In this video, I'm gonna come back after each screening and give you my initial thoughts and reviews. I wrote down notes immediately after watching each movie, and I'm just gonna let you know how I enjoyed them and what I thought of it. The cool thing about TIFF is that we get to watch these movies in really cool theaters around Toronto. So I started my first day at the Royal Alexander. There may be some spoilers, so Here's your warning. Let's get into it. We're back, baby. Let's go. Wildcat, directed by Ethan Hawke, starring Maya Hawke. Fun fact, they're related. And her mom is Uma Thurman? Learning so the much. cast and crew was in attendance, which was very fun. And it was actually half of the cast's first time watching the movie, too. It was my first time watching the movie as well. This movie was a biopic about author Flannery O'Connor, a movie weaved between her life and her short stories. It was really well told and well directed, I think. The weaving of the stories that she wrote between the timelines of her life really showed how her writings were affected by the things that were going on around her. There were a few scenes throughout that stood out. But personally, it felt a little slow at times. That being said, I did find the movie a lot better once I learned a little bit more about who the author was from the cast and crew. Maya Hawk related her life of trying to find her purpose as an artist to Flannery's struggle of being a writer. And once I had a little bit more insight and background on Flannery O'Connor, the movie made a little bit more sense to me. I think it was supposed to be a movie about the importance of storytelling and writers along with being a good biopic of the author herself. I think it would 100% be a better movie if you know about who Flannery O'Connor is, if you're familiar with her work and her life. Also, Ethan Hawke is the coolest guy, like in person. Whenever you see videos of Ethan Hawke talking, that's just how he, he talks. He talks exactly like Ethan Hawke talks. And he's cool. The next night, I went to the Princess of Wales Theatre to watch a movie that I had really high hopes for. Movie number two, Next Goal Wins by Taika YTT. Taika YTT. I'm all smiles. That was a great, feel-good, inspirational comedy about the American Samoan soccer team. And it's a true story that follows the team in 2011, and they're trying to score their first ever goal after a big defeat of 31 to nothing against the Australian team in the World Cup qualifier in 2001. And that's a true story. Uh, it was funny, and it was heartwarming, and I was at the edge of my seat when they play that qualifier match. I love the humor. It's very childish and silly and deadpan. There's a bunch of good little visual gags as well. If you've seen Jojo Rabbit or Hunt for the Wilder People or any other Taika Waititi movies, if you like that style of comedy, you're gonna enjoy this. It was really funny. So cool that it was a true story as well. Had no idea that this soccer team even existed. This feels like it's gonna be in the theaters, around, easily accessible. It's a big movie. Wednesday took me back to the Princess of Wales Theater for a French comedy. Okay. Movie number three, third time's the charm. Yesterday's was good too though. A Difficult Year, a French comedy about an environmentalist group and two down-on-their-luck guys that stumble into it. This was a very funny movie, but it still delivered a good message about overconsumption and climate change, but not be it but it was also it wasn't preachy, which was good. I didn't I liked how it wasn't preachy, stayed more on the comedy side, but still had those aspects in it. It was nice. The chemistry between the leads was great. It was really good. They had a great dynamic. Uh, and the comedy felt really real and natural. And it came from things that was just happening amongst the conversation. It didn't feel forced. The French have a good sense of humor. Who to thunk? The audience was chuckling. And I was audience. One of the directors and a lead actor was there to answer questions afterward. They spoke in French and they had a translator. So who knows what they actually said, but got some cool insights on the movie, how they filmed it, 
what their process was. Really enjoyed this. This was one of those movies where you probably aren't going to watch it in theaters. Like it's not the big blockbuster, but it's a really good movie. Took a little break Thursday, but Friday, I'm dumb and watched three movies in one day. It's a lot, that's a lot of movies. It's two more than watching one movie and normally one movie's enough. But the first one was The Boy and the Heron. Good morning. Number one of a triple feature today. The Boy and the Heron. A highlight movie that I was very excited to see by Studio Ghibli. Visually, this was great. As expected, it was amazing animation. 10 out of 10 and everything you could possibly want from a Studio Ghibli movie. Spirits, funny animals, landscapes, amazing food. It had it all. Now... <laughs> Story-wise, <laughs> I'm not sure if it was my favorite, unfortunately. It's definitely not a kid's movie. It has themes of war and death, childhood trauma, and the afterlife. So don't expect any sort of Totoro-type happiness, kids playing around in the field sort of thing. It starts off very realistic and almost like a slice-of-life type of movie. Uh, it was slow and very wonderful, but I felt like I was waiting a bit too long for the fantasy and for the narrative to come into play. And then it does, and it hits you very hard with uh, just pure fantasy and metaphor and spirits and symbolism. It was almost too much. I kind of had a hard time following why and what was happening at some point. A lot of ideas and concepts get brought up for them to not really be seen again for no real reason other than maybe for the world building and the amazing visuals. But then having that in there kind of didn't help with the narrative again. I need to read some critical analyses on what everything meant because the symbolism was a lot. It seems like Mr. Miyazaki was thinking, this is my last movie. I had this concept and character. Let's just toss it into the fantasy world and see what happens. It was really good though. I've, it was, I just watched it right now, so hard to kind of get a grasp of everything. Two more movies today. Let's go. After that was two back-to-back -back Korean movies. And I had realized then at this point that the whole day I'd be reading a lot of subtitles. Double feature night, got home at two in the morning. So making this now good morning. The first of the night was Concrete Utopia, a Korean sci-fi end of the world dystopian type movie about a giant earthquake that takes down every single apartment building in Korea except for one. So it follows those characters and how they build and find food and deal with people coming into their apartment complex and the people that live there and it was some good conflicts between the residences and their opinions on how food should be distributed, who needs to go out and find food. Pretty good if you like that sort of dystopian end of the world type of movie. It was slightly predictable for this type of genre. It's kind of like the, the Walking Dead, kind of like Lord of the Flies. But it did keep me engaged. It had a cool plot, some good character development. If you're a fan of the genre, I think you'd, you'd want to check this out. Pretty good. After that one was done, I walked down the road to watch Sleep at Midnight, and the director was there, so that was cool. This was a Korean thriller horror movie about a couple and the husband begins sleepwalking. Spooky. <laughs> there were a couple jump scares at the start, but then nothing really happened. Some shocks and suspense and a little bit of gory. It was a fun straight watch. There was nothing crazy, no big twists and turns. And it was definitely fun to watch with an audience to get all the reactions of the gross things that were happening on screen. Of the horror movies I've watched, I haven't watched too many. They normally end, I feel, with something very, really, really ambiguous and like leaves you wondering whether the ghost or the murderer is still at large or out there and who they're going to get next. But this one had, this one wasn't. <laughs> this one didn't have an ambiguous ending. It just, it had a finish. It was nice. It could have been interpreted one way, but I think it just, it meant to kind of wrap up at the end. And that was that. Not too shabby. And finally, the last day, a double feature to finish it off. Okay, Saturday night double feature. Two movies to finish off all of TIFF. Let's start with Alice and Jack. This was an unconventional, messy love story starring the wonderful and lovely Donald Gleason. Dom Hall, Dom Nall, Dom Nall Gleason. We love a good Weasley. We're just going to call him Bill from now on. His name is Jack in the movie. So we can say Jack or Bill, but it, we're talking about him. When we first meet Alice, I did not really like her. Um, but as the story progresses, we learn more about her troubled past 
and you can start to empathize for what she's like by the end of it. I don't understand how Jack was immediately in love with Alice, but alas. <laughs> I learned uh, the night before that this actually wasn't a movie, but it's a limited series. That's right, it's a TV show, and I wasn't too sure how they were gonna show this, but the director and Bill Weasley was there after to answer questions, and they said that this is just the first third of the entire limited series. I think it's eight episodes total, so they showed just over two episodes. Uh, the entire thing will take place over 16 years, which is very cool. And I think spending multiple hours within this relationship and with these characters are definitely gonna benefit because it's very much not a simple story. There's a lot happening. They teased it gets better, but they could be lying <laughs> since they made this. It was a good watch. I want to know how it ends. I wanna know more. And before I talk about that final film, let's talk about the festival. The bads first. They increased the price from last year. Boo. They took away the flexible group pass of movies that I got last year. Boo. But it was still very fun. <laughs> and for some reason, I got to see four different movies that had the director and cast at the screening. So that was a lot of fun, even with all these uh, strikes going on. And every director and actor kept saying that TIFF is their favorite festival. It's the people's festival, and apparently we're the best audience. So... Good on us. Even though I think the movies I watched last year were a bit better overall than this year, uh, that could just be my fault for picking all these movies. Still had a great time, a lot of fun. For some reason, there's that Bulgari ad again, and everyone clapped again, and it was great. Everyone still yells, arg, at the piracy screen. Arrgh. I think that will always be a highlight. Overall, I'm definitely gonna do this again. Maybe not have three movies in one night. Maybe four. <laughs> and then to finish off Tiff, Dick's the Musical. I hate that this was the movie that I enjoyed the most this week. <laughs> uh, I would highly recommend watching this with no context, no trailers. Just don't watch anything, just go into it and know that you're watching an R-rated, very silly, very raunchy thing. That's all you need to know. Go watch There's it. There's a flying <laughs> swamp goblin aliens, twins who end up in a r incestual relationship, and Megan the Stallion. So I don't know what's the craziest part of that sentence. This was extremely hard to unpack and review because so much happened. It was loosely based on Parent Trap, and that's the only thing I read to convince my friends to come watch this. So I'm so sorry. I did not know what we were getting into. I had zero expectations of what this actually was. It is not good for your fun family movie nights. Do not watch this with children. <laughs> the musical numbers were really funny. Uh, some really catchy songs, great lyrics and performances. I was laughing throughout the entire thing. There must have been a lot of improv. They had a classic blooper reel at the end of the movie. So I don't know if that tells you what type of movie this was. It looked was. like so much fun to film. <laughs> Megan Mullally was weird and great. She, her character is so funny. I think it's a movie that I could probably watch one more time just because of how outlandish it was. But I don't know if I'd watch it more than that because I think it's the shock and unpredictability as the story goes on that really kept me in. Uh, but it was hilarious and a highlight of this year's tip. <laughs> Bye. Thanks for watching. Um, mini, mini segment. I have a lot of uh, photos and videos coming from a trip to Calgary. I took some of the best pictures ever. It's gonna be dope.